Welcome to the Christian Mysticism Podcast, where we explore the fascinating history of Christian mysticism from the early days of the church until today. I'm Alberto de la Cruz, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Carlos Ayer, the T. Lawrenson Riggs Professor of History and Religious Studies at Yale University. Welcome back, Carlos. Hi, Alberto. Can't say Happy New Year anymore since it's almost February, but it still feels like it's the new year for me. Well, it just got started, but as we get older, the years start moving by faster and faster. <laughs> that is true, most definitely. Sometimes I still, uh, when I'm putting the date on a check, I write 1968. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck in the distant past. Uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's the year I learned how to write checks. I think that's the reason, you know, that's the date that just that for some reason my brain processes it that way. You got stuck in 1968. Yes. <laughs> so before we get started, first of all, I wanted to thank all our great listeners for all the great comments and questions you're sending in to us. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and like the podcast so you don't miss another episode. And one other programming note, this episode will be going live on February 1st, and our usual schedule is an episode on the first and third Thursday of every month. But this month of February, due to a scheduling conflict, we're not going to be able to have an episode ready to go live on the 15th. That's third Thursday. So this year, being a leap year, February has 29 days, and it also has five Thursdays. So our next episode after this one will be coming out on February 22nd. So don't worry. We're still there. It's just a one-week delay. So with that said, let's get on with this episode. Who do you have for us today, Carlos? Well, we are going to cover St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, who lived from 1647 to 1690. So 17th century visitation nun. St. Margaret Mary is a very unusual person, period, but also a very unusual mystic. One reason that she has a fairly important place in modern mysticism, or actually modern Christian devotion, is that she took information from her visions and turned them into a form of popular devotion. So she is a link between the Christian mystical tradition and popular devotion uh, in a way that few others are. So this role that she plays as a um, transmitter of mystical experiences to ordinary believers places her in a very special category among the mystics that we have covered thus far. And her life is, well, short by our standards. She didn't live all that long. Before she died when she was 42 or 43. But she began having deeply spiritual experiences as a girl and is one of these saints. Uh, she follows this pattern, uh, which is one of the patterns for, for some saints, which is that they are saintly or very devoted to seeking out God from very early on. And that is definitely her case, because when she was nine years old, which is when she had her first communion, she pledged herself to Jesus Christ completely. And one would think, oh, well, she's headed straight for the convent. But no, this is not what happened. Uh, her father died when she was still fairly young, so she was orphaned and raised under some trying circumstances, especially because there was some problem with the, the will her father had left, and, and the family for some time was impoverished. So, as it turned out, she didn't enter the convent till she was 24. So, between 9 and 24, she has this uh, great longing to give herself to Jesus, but it's very hard to do uh, outside of a convent, especially because her mother kept trying to marry her off <laughs> and insisting that she go to balls and parties and so on so that she could meet the right man to marry. But she had absolutely no intention of getting married, becoming a mother and head of a household. She was pretty intent on giving herself over to Jesus and actually said that in one point in her autobiography, because we do have her telling us her own story, 
in her autobiography that she would rather be chopped to pieces than be married to any man. She belonged to Jesus and to Jesus alone. So there we go with this mystical marriage theme again. Her mother wants her to have a, an earthly husband. She doesn't want an earthly husband. She already has Jesus. So she is an effective mystic for sure, because her mysticism is all about not just her love for Jesus, but Jesus' love for her and Jesus' love for all of humanity. Of those, all those three loves just mentioned, that is perhaps the most significant one in the messages that she had to convey from Jesus, is how much he loves the human race. When did she start having mystical ex- experiences? Well, she started having uh, visions as a girl, and she thought this was normal, that this is something that happened to everyone. But her most intense visions came later, once that she was a nun. Her most intense visions were in the years 1673 to 1675, already in the convent. But they created problems for her, as we have seen before, time and time again. Is okay, fine, you can claim that you have visions, but are you going to be believed? And in her case, once again, as we've seen with others, her own community, her own fellow sisters, and her superior were not so sure that her visions were genuine. So she went through a difficult time. Eventually, yeah, she came to be believed and respected and admired, but it was a long haul between the visions she had as a child and the visions that then later she had as a nun and being believed and being admired. So what distinguishes her is her visions. She's a visionary. Many mystics are visionaries. They have visions. Uh, Hers seem to have been very, very realistic. We can discuss this in another podcast, but mystics have come to identify different kinds of visions. You know, there are intellectual visions you see with your, in your mind. And then there are actual physical visions that you see with your eyes. And by the time you get to St. Teresa, it's already been discerned that it's much easier to be deluded with actual physical visions than with intellectual visions. But one can still be deluded, which is the reason that anyone who claims to have a vision is not trusted immediately, has to gain people's trust. It's not just a question of delusion, but of course, the possibility that uh, the vision uh, was real, but it was not from God, but rather from the devil, as happened to Teresa of Avila. Now, her confessor told her, no, those that Christ isn't really showing up to you. That's the devil. You're having demonic visions. And it took her a while to convince others that, yeah, no, she was seeing Christ. So what sets her apart from other mystics? Because I know there's something special about her. What sets her apart is the content of her visions. And that content is and has everything to do with devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. And what is that? Uh, That's what she turns into a popular devotion. And it is, she's receiving messages from Jesus, right? I want people to venerate my heart. And that might sound very strange to anyone who has not been brought up in the the Catholic tradition, perhaps even to some Catholics, because uh, modern 21st century Catholicism tends not to focus on this kind of devotion. I was going to ask you if you can, for our non-Catholic friends or those who haven't really been raised with that, can can you give us a little background on the Sacred Heart? Yeah, sure. Devotion to the Sacred Heart began in the Middle Ages, especially after the 12th century or so. And devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus emerged from another earlier devotion to the five wounds of Jesus. Now, keep in mind, since the earliest days of the Christian religion, Jesus' crucifixion right, was a central focus of devotion because it is his, his act of self-sacrifice that redeems the human race. So 
from very early on, we see that there is a focus on the passion account of Jesus. You see it in all four Gospels, for instance. The amount of space or the number of pages devoted in each of the Gospels to the crucifixion and death of Jesus is far larger than, than any other aspect of Jesus' life. You know, it's, it's something that happens basically within a 24 to 36 hour period, but it's a huge chunk of each gospel. So from very early on, there was devotion to the suffering of Jesus and to the redemptive value of those wounds that he sustained. And there was a special focus on the nailing, the four wounds left by the nails, one in each hand one on each foot. And then the fifth wound, after he's died on the cross, the Roman soldier comes and pierces his side with a lance, and out come blood and water. So this has been a focus of devotion for centuries, but beginning in the 12th century especially, we begin to see a special devotion emerging to the heart of Jesus, which was pierced by the soldier's lance. So this devotion to the heart, we tend to think of the heart, you know, in medical terms as the pump that's the center of the circulatory system. And the organ, which we now uh, know is a muscle that keeps everyone alive. They had knowledge of this in ancient times too. But since ancient times, the heart was identified as the seat of emotions. And we still have that to some extent, which is, you know, uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. What's the symbol for Valentine's Day? You know, oh, it's a, it's a heart, and you get heart balloons and heart this and heart that, heart cakes. We still live with this idea of the heart as the seat of emotions, and especially the emotion of love. So the wounded heart of Jesus came to symbolize or signify his incomparable love for the human race as well as the pain he endured for sake of the human race. And gradually, that symbol came to be represented in art and emerged to have a very specific form. And for anyone who has not seen an image of the Sacred Heart, especially this, I'm talking about the image that developed after Margaret Mary Alacoque made this devotion very popular. You have the image of a heart with a huge gash in it, the wound from the lance. And out of the gash, you see some blood dripping. The heart itself is encircled in a crown of thorns, another symbol for the passion of Christ. So you've got a gash and you've got a crown of thorns symbolizing the pain and suffering that Jesus endured. And then out of the very top, flames of fire shooting out from the heart. Uh, anyone who sees it for the first time usually thinks this is, this is just too totally weird and might actually be distressed or put off by seeing this image. But it, it's, uh, again, symbols carry messages that reach humans in places that are very deep in the human psyche. And that's why symbols are such an essential part, not just of culture, but especially religions because symbols deliver their message to the deepest places in the human consciousness and are grasped in ways that are more enduring and stronger because they appeal and speak to the emotions. So therefore, this symbol of love, this sacred heart, you can imagine, oh my Lord, the, the, the amount of meaning that's packed into that is just intense. There's so many different layers of meaning in there. It's funny because as you describe this image of the Sacred Heart, it brings back memories of my childhood when I was a kid growing up in our house. In our dining room, we had a portrait of Jesus. And I remember it was one of those portraits where no matter where you're standing, he's looking at you. His eyes seem oh, to yes. be looking oh, at yes. you. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. But it was a, it was sort of like a portrait of Jesus from kind of mid chest up and then in the chest area where the heart would be there was like a a heart outside of it his actual mm -hmm. heart with the crown of thorns around it and right. and the blood and i 
as a kid, I always remember looking at it and it was a little creepy to me because why is his heart outside his body? Yes. And it wasn't until, you know, later on in life, you're an adult and you kind of understand what, learn what the sacred heart is. Uh, you know what it means, but that was an image that I would see several times every single day because you had to go through the dining room to get to the kitchen and Jesus was looking at me every time. Yes. And that, you know, I had similar reactions as a child. And I also, as a child, saw not only these images of Jesus with, you know, actually, he's usually pointing to his sacred heart in these images, like the one you mentioned. At least one of his hands is pointing to his heart. But I also remember images that were just, you know, like just the heart on the wall, you know, in a frame. And I, th- I always thought, what, what is this? This is part of what, you know, as a child, I was very much negatively affected by this imagery that was never explained to me. And it just was there. But I later discovered the inner meanings and now appreciate them for what they are. But I have to admit that they are and can be very scary to someone who doesn't know what they represent. I remember once when I was in graduate school, one of my professors who was not Catholic, remarked that this devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus has got to be the strangest devotion in all of Christian history (laughs) because it's devotion to, you know, an organ of the body, not to the person, but just to one organ in his body, his body being Jesus' body, right? And he was just flummoxed very, very uh, intensely by this. And went on at some length about how peculiar and how, quote unquote, wrong this devotion was. Of course, he wasn't Catholic. You can add another layer to the meaning of the heart, which is that it's an emphasis on the humanity of Christ, on the full humanity of Christ, right? But it is, and there's no two ways about it, it is a broken heart. It's got a huge gash in it. And part of the message received by Margaret Mary, which then was folded into devotion to the Sacred Heart, is this broken heart of Jesus. Why is his heart broken? His heart is broken because he gave his life for the world. And and so many humans, even those who have been baptized, don't live the right kind of life and don't pay attention to, to him, to Jesus, and don't care about the sacrifice he made. He wants everyone to be saved, but free will being what it is, so many people, actually the majority of of the human race on earth, they don't live the right kind of life. And so many still don't know about his sacrifice or don't care, even if they've been baptized. So it's a very profound message, this symbol, which has many layers to it. It's just such a strong symbol a bloody heart with a gash in it, with a crown of thorns around it, bleeding, right. water coming out of it. And I can understand how people can view it and kind of think it's strange. It's not this, – this is kind of – not to use the word again, but this is kind of creepy. But in reality, at, at least to me, it's it's a symbol, the heart being the symbol of love. It's – he gave his heart, you know, just like – in love stories, you know, one lover gives their heart to another and they're not actually giving their physical heart, but it's symbolic. And that's how you portray it in a painting, in a symbol with the heart. So it's still difficult, but I think the magnitude of Christ's love for for us and for humanity kind of demands a symbol that is really striking, that really does catch your attention. Oh, and catch your attention, it does. Because don't forget, it has flames shooting out of the top. That that as well. That (laughs) as well. And, you know, I I just thought of something. I can't remember if we covered this with uh, St. Catherine of Siena or not. I'm pretty sure we did. That one of her visions, she and Jesus exchanged hearts. You did cover that. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. So Catherine of Siena exchanged hearts with Jesus in her vision, literally. 
Margaret Mary Alacoque had a similar vision, but the exchange of hearts was different in that, you know, Jesus took her heart and put it inside his heart, and then he pulled it out like some flaming, incandescent spark, and then put it back in Margaret Mary. But it's still an exchange of hearts that takes place, which takes place in a vision and has even more symbolism in it than just an image of Jesus' sacred heart. So how did Margaret Mary make this devotion? How did it become so popular? What, what was it about it that she well, was able to make this so popular? Well, she had help. She went through a considerable amount of time when people were not paying attention to her and actually you know, denigrating her visions. But she ended up getting a new confessor who was a member of the Society of Jesus, a Jesuit, the Jesuit order, Claude de Colombier, who not only believed her, but started using his position within his order, the Jesuit order, and as well the Jesuits within the church, promoting veneration of the Sacred Heart. Because part of the message, the vision that she received from 1673, 1675, part of the message was, you have got to take this to the people. You have got to, you know, just make it known any way possible that people should venerate my heart. So said Jesus. But then it's difficult to sell anything, even if you're being helped by a a prominent Jesuit. Promises were linked to this request that Jesus made to Margaret Mary. And these promises make veneration to the Sacred Heart a very pragmatic thing. Let me read you verbatim, you know, word for word, what specific blessings Jesus promised to anyone and everyone who practiced devotion to his Sacred Heart. And I am going to read them one by one. And they're quite a few. And they're all very nice promises. I will give them all the graces necessary for their state of life. I will give peace in their families. I will console them in all their troubles. I will be their refuge in life and especially in death. I will abundantly bless all their undertakings. Sinners shall find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Tepid souls shall become fervent. Fervent souls shall rise speedily to great perfection. I will bless those places wherein the image of my sacred heart shall be exposed and venerated. So see that image in your house, Alberto? Carried that promise with it. I will give to priests the power to touch the most hardened hearts. Persons who propagate this devotion shall have their names eternally written in my heart. In the excess of mercy of my heart, I promise you that all my powerful love will grant to all those who will receive communion on the first Friday for nine consecutive months the grace of final repentance. They will not die in my displeasure, nor without receiving the sacraments and my heart will be their secure refuge in that last hour. That's quite a list of promises, which includes that peculiar request for individuals to take communion on the first Friday of the month for nine consecutive months, which is one aspect of this that strikes many non-Catholics as very strange. Well, as a Catholic myself, I have to say that's the first time I've ever heard that. Wow, see, well, you're younger than I am. And the reforms of Vatican do did away with a lot of things in Catholic piety and Catholic devotion. And this having communion on First Fridays for nine consecutive months, I remember that being very, very prominently announced and repeated and people doing it before the Second Vatican Council. And also, uh, it's not a part of the promises, but something else that Jesus asked Margaret Mary, the visions, was that people venerate the consecrated host that in many Catholic churches for centuries 
they have hours of veneration of the host where the you know the host is placed in a monstrance which is the it's usually cross-shaped and it has a glass enclosure in which is a consecrated host and venerating that was part of the message as well as the taking communion for nine consecutive first fridays and here to return to that that's the promise attached to it is that if you do that and you only need to do it once if you do that you will not die a bad death you will be able to repent and also to receive the sacraments which means you're guaranteed salvation now you may have to spend time in purgatory but you're guaranteed to escape from being sent to hell because as all the other promises also emphasize if you do this if you venerate the sacred heart you will become a good person well it sounds like a great deal to me I would say so. American advertisers could learn a lot <laughs> if they were to attach promises like this to their products, right? They try on their commercials, but no, this th- these are these are serious promises, very serious promises, which of course require a leap of faith. This is all about faith, right? But, you know, this brings us face to face with one way in which the visionary mystical experiences of one nun are turned into a popular devotion. And I, I need to emphasize again with some more detail than I already have that, you know, she's not the first mystic to have visions of the sacred heart or to be devoted to the sacred heart. No, many medieval mystics did. St. Francis, St. Bernard, Max Kilda of Helfte, Gertrude the Great, John of Avila, Francis de Sales, and a group of spiritual writers in the late 15th, early 16th century who wrote many w- works of devotion that became very popular, especially including one who went by the single name of Blosius, Jean de Blois. So she was not inventing anything, and Jesus was not revealing anything truly new to her. It's just that keep in mind the timing here. We're talking about the 1670s. And uh, already skepticism. This is at, towards the end of the age of religious wars, you know, Protestants versus Catholics. Religious divisions had given rise to a lot of skepticism about Christianity and religion in general. So Jesus' sorrow is doubled by the rise in skepticism, the violence that has taken place for a century and a half, Christians killing Christians, and so on and so forth. So this message and all the promises are very timely if you take into account the cultural context in which these promises are being made. It's almost like a, well, it is not like, it is supposed to be a source of healing for a broken society. So Sister Margaret Mary received these instructions from Jesus in a vision. Tell us a little bit more about some other visions that she had. Well, you know, her autobiography is full of accounts of the visions that she had. And again, I have to admit that anyone who reads that autobiography might be surprised to see that in many of the visions, uh, Jesus keeps making demands of Margaret Mary, especially the demand that, that she be as perfect as possible, right? As sinless as possible that she remove every element of pride and vanity from her life. But again, this is a familiar theme with mystics, right? And it's the paradoxical kind of yin and yang of being holy, being admired by others, but having to be very self-effacing and humble at the same time. So actually many of the exchanges because you know if you read her autobiography they're, 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 her her visions of Jesus are like conversations for instance here's one in one of these visions my divine heart says Jesus is so inflamed with love for men and for you in particular that being unable any longer to contain within itself the flames of its burning love it must needs spread then abroad by any means and manifest itself to them, to mankind, humankind, in order to enrich them with the precious treasures which I discover to you or 
another way of translating it, revealed to you, and which contain graces of sanctification and salvation necessary to withdraw them from the abyss of perdition. I have chosen you, he's speaking to her, as an abyss of unworthiness and ignorance for the accomplishment of this great design in order that everything may be done by me. So in a, in a way, you, know, you read this one way and he's actually, you know, like insulting her. She's an abyss of unworthiness and ignorance. Her Jesus loves her and, and she loves him, but he is a very demanding lover. And uh, here's another exchange. After Holy Communion, he, Jesus, asked me to renew the sacrifice I had already made him of my liberty and my whole being. And I did so with all my heart. I said, provided, my sovereign master, that you will never allow anything extraordinary to appear in me, but what may cause me humiliation and abjection before creatures and lower me in their esteem. So, you know, like, please make it so that I will be humiliated. For alas, she continues, oh my God, I feel my weakness. I fear to betray you and that your gifts should not be safe with me. Fear nothing, my daughter, replies Jesus. Leave all to me, for I will constitute myself the guardian of them and render thee powerless to resist me. What then, my God? Will you always let me live without suffering? Says Margaret Mary. And then comes this. Immediately, a large cross was shown to me, the extremity of which I could not see, but it was all covered with flowers. Behold the bed of my chaste spouses, on which I shall make you taste all the delights of my pure love, says Jesus. Little by little, these flowers will drop off, and nothing will remain but the thorns, which are hidden because of your weakness. Nevertheless, you shall feel the pricks of these thorns so keenly that you will need all the strength of my love to bear the pain. And then says Margaret Mary to the reader in her autobiography, these words delighted me as I thought I should never find enough suffering, humiliations, or contempt to quench the burning thirst I had for them, and that I could never experience greater suffering than that which I felt at not suffering enough. For my love for him gave me no respite day or night. But I was distressed to be enjoying so much sweetness. I wished for the cross alone. Pretty strong stuff. And again, our listeners might be wondering why is all this pain and suffering and humiliation uh, necessary for salvation? And what, what is this? You know, this is 17th century piety, 17th century mysticism. You know, it's not till the late 19th century that suffering is taken out of the picture, let's put it that way, in the Christian religion. And I think we've talked about this before. And my take on it is that before the mid-19th century, discoveries in medicine had been such that pain and suffering, when they came your way, were inescapable. Pain relievers, anesthesia, and then eventually psychiatric drugs have taken care of much suffering. They, they don't wipe it out. But actually, for those of us that live in uh, well-off countries in the early 21st century, there's a pill for almost every kind of pain. So back then, all of this suffering was so inescapable. This is one way of putting a positive spin on it. You know, it's for your good, your own good. Humility and self-effacement do not strike us in early 21st century North America as a good thing. No, you're supposed to love yourself, be proud of yourself. That's what we're all taught. But humility is a constant in Christian theology and in Christian mysticism from the first century to the present. He who is the least among you shall be the greatest. It's in the Gospels. And then the lesson that Jesus gives the apostles in the Gospel of John at the Last Supper, washing their feet and saying basically, hey guys, this is what you have to do. You have to be the servant of everybody, and so on and so forth. Yeah, humility and self-effacing have been part of the Christian message from day one. It just doesn't sit comfortably with secular culture that we live in. 
Yes, he who is first shall be last, he who is last shall be first. And we have discussed this before. I believe in several episodes, this topic has come up of pain and suffering. But I think it's also the philosophy we have in society now where any pain and suffering, as you mentioned, is unacceptable. And it's all about what makes me feel good. And as long as I'm happy, taking care of oneself and ignoring others. Personally, I think that has done a lot of harm or has really taken the focus off what the Gospels and what Jesus has said. I think Jesus made it very clear in the Gospels, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer because of me. Everyone has their cross to bear. You must carry your cross. He never promised yes. a wonderful life. And again, go back to St. Augustine. The fundamental problem of human beings is selfishness. You know, looking out for number one, looking out for yourself. Christianity has always been a very outward facing kind of ethic where, you know, why am I on earth? Am I on earth to um, party all the time? <laughs> or am I on earth to make the place better for everybody? Right? Give of yourself and so on and so forth. So, you know, I'll be very frank. And very honest, you know, when I read these passages, like the one I just read from Margaret Mary's autobiography, I find this focus on perfection, on absolute perfection, I find it scary and daunting. Because, of course, perfection is impossible. But as the saying goes, and there are various ways that the saying is expressed, right? He who aims high does better than he who aims low. <laughs> So aim for perfection, right? Passage in the Gospels. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Also in another Gospel, be merciful as your Father is merciful. But actually, I was just uh, reading in Luke's Gospel, this uh, call Jesus makes to carry your cross. He adds, daily. Pick up your cross daily. So Luke puts this in there. Daily as a reminder of the fact that, yeah, we have to give of ourselves. And it's what Margaret Mary did in her own way, you know, given her culture and her time, and monastic culture, too. But it took her a while to get people to believe her. The devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus was not officially recognized and approved until 1765 by Pope Clement XIII. That's 75 years after her death. And she was declared venerable in March of 1824 by Pope Leo XII, pronounced blessed in 1864 by Pope Pius IX, and finally canonized, declared a saint in 1920. So only 100 years ago, 104, by Pope Benedict XV. And finally, it was in 1856, that the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus was placed on the Catholic calendar to be celebrated every year. So all these things took time, but boy, uh, Catholic homes filled up with images of the Sacred Heart, either by itself or as in your house and mine too, right in Jesus' chest, outside his body. Scary stuff. My house, we also had a, a Jesus whose eyes followed you. <laughs> well, we also had a portrait of Jesus, a smaller one, and it was, I forget what they call it, but those prism that the image changes depending on the angle that you're looking at. Oh, yes. Yeah. And yes. I, for, I forget what those are called, but we also had one of those. And I remember as a kid just moving side to side. Right. Yes. <laughs> watching it change. Yeah. And I, I I can't even remember what it you know, what the two images, I, I just know it was Jesus. But the Sacred yes. Heart, I would see it in my home. I would see it in my friends' homes, in my neighbors' right. homes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, growing up in, in a very Catholic, very Cuban, uh, American, little Havana in Miami, it's it was a very well, typical it, scene. And it was strange not to find it in somebody's home. Let's just put it that way. Absolutely. And actually, you know, what I've discovered over the past uh, decade, decade and a half is that the symbol of the Sacred Heart has become a very popular tattoo. 
not necessarily linked to devotion to the Sacred Heart. It actually, one very um, strange area in which these tattoos show up is in gangs in California, southwestern states, mostly Mexican and Mexican-American and Central American gangs. The symbol of the Sacred Heart has become immensely popular. Would you call the symbol of the Sacred Heart a symbol of mysticism or a form oh, of mysticism? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. And as you see, I didn't hesitate in answering it at all. Yes, it's all about divine love. But, you know, the flip side of it, you know, that, that big gash in, in the sacred heart, it's the broken heart of God for the way in which human beings behave. It's the, the need that every Christian mystic has felt for redemption and for, you know, aiming for perfection. Try to be as good as you can. Work at it. <laughs> Ask for help. And those flames shooting out of the top, yeah, definitely. A, a very mystical symbol. I should add, and maybe we can cover this in another podcast, that there's also a veneration of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The symbolism is similar, but the two are different. The Immaculate Heart of Mary is surrounded by roses, but the heart is pierced by seven swords as the suffering she underwent when she had to witness her son's awful death. Now, the Sacred Heart of Jesus was also a symbol for a political movement. Yes, it came to be that, especially in France. Yes, very much so. During the French Revolution, French Revolution was committed to a program of, they called it this, de-Christianization, de-Christianizing France, turning all the churches into temples of reason, creating new feast days that had nothing to do with religion murdering priests, murdering nuns, murdering Christians who supported the priests and nuns. So the symbol of the Sacred Heart became symbol of resistance against the French Revolution. And after the French Revolution ended, came Napoleon, France became an empire and an empire and republics. And the secularizing uh, goals of the French Revolution remained behind even after the French Revolution ended. So in French Catholicism, the symbol of the Sacred Heart became a symbol for resistance to secularization. And that's very important to keep in mind. And to this day, still, I think it carries this meaning in French culture. I'm not sure. I have not done research on this. I don't know if this translates, you know, literally translates to other cultures other than France. The Sacred Heart is a, a symbol of resistance to secularization, but very much so. And, you know, it was very strong in France through the 19th century into the 20th century. And this magnificent church built in Paris, the Sacre Coeur, Sacred Heart, up on the hill of Montmartre, the highest point in Paris, it's built in the late 19th century in honor of the Sacred Heart of Jesus so that he would protect France. France had just lost the Franco-Prussian War, 1871, and actually the church was erected as uh, expiation for the sins committed by the French that had caused their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. It's an immense church built over, uh, the, there were formerly mines underneath in this huge hill. So actually making its foundations strong enough was something of a challenge, but they, they managed to do it. And now it's one of the big tourist spots, uh, Paris. But the Sacred Heart remains pretty much on the margins in present-day Catholic culture, especially here in North America. And I think if anyone were to take a poll of American Catholics, ask them, do you know what the Sacred Heart is? My guess is that a very, very high percentage, perhaps a majority, wouldn't know what to say. Well, hopefully this episode will help those Catholics who <laughs> will help those Catholics who have never learned the symbolism and the meaning behind the Sacred Heart that they've witnessed over their lifetimes. And for our non-Catholic friends, we'll give them a good idea of of what it means. 
It, it's basically yeah. a symbol of Christ's endless love for each individual, for humanity. Right. And, and uh, for our need for redemption, because we are always, uh, always tempted to do wrong things. Well, I guess we can say thanks to Sister Margaret Mary, or I should say St. Margaret Mary, for bringing this to us and opening our eyes to what it is. And 400 years later, almost 400 years later, we're still talking about it. So that's a good thing. It's still there. The images are still there. But a very interesting story and eye-opening for some who may have been wondering why those flaming hearts with thorns and blood and water images have been around us for so long. So we have a couple weeks until the next episode comes out. Tell us who we're going to be talking about. I think we need to go back in time because we've gotten some requests for us to take up some topics, uh, one of them being the, the topic of divinization. That's part of Christian mysticism. Divinization, also called theosis, that's the Greek word. So I, I think maybe we should go back to 4th century, Gregory of Nyssa, who, uh, of course, there was still only one church before 1054. The Orthodox and Catholic churches were one. So he's very much a, an Orthodox saint because he's from the eastern part of the Mediterranean. But he's also a very important Catholic saint. And I, I was actually looking him up today, and there was a website that declared him the father of Christian mysticism. <laughs> I didn't have time to read the article. Why give him that title? So it kind of piqued my interest. So let's, let's have some time with Gregory of Nyssa next time. Thank you, Carlos. And until the next time, thank you for listening to the Christian Mysticism Podcast. If you have any questions for Dr. Ayer, you'll find our email address in the show notes. Just send it over and we'll try to answer it in a future episode. And don't forget to click the subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode of the Christian Mysticism Podcast.